Welcome to the Chronic Spoonful Podcast, where we discuss real life with real chronic illness. Each week, we'll cover an aspect of real life spoony living and what that can mean for different chronic illnesses. We hope this will be a place you can go for updated spoony info and where you'll find humor because, you know, we're a little crazy, important information, and community. As a disclaimer, we just want to remind you that, yes, we'll be talking about chronic illness and health information, but we are not your doctor. Everyone's chronic illness is different, and we are absolutely not MDs, so we are not qualified to give you medical advice. We're going to tell you unequivocally to discuss anything we talk about on this podcast with your doctor. All right. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, and... Thank you for listening. Now that we've gone again through all our disclaimers, because we love that, you know, you guys get to listen to those disclaimers every week, but we got to do them. Uh, Let's talk about what's new and noteworthy. We hope you guys had a good week. Um, Continue to share that with us on our Facebook page and in our uh, little comment section on all of our social media. And, um, but we have some news this week that has come out and I don't know about in all of the chronic illness community that it's being shared, but it's definitely being shared in the uh, EDS community that the in the university community, they think that they have actually isolated a gene that will identify hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And this is very exciting and scary for people in the EDS community because as you know, with, with, hyper, with hypermobile EDS, it is, again, a kind of a disease of elimination. And you kind of go through this criteria that you have to meet because there's no genetic, there, for a long time, there was no genetic component to it. They, could, they couldn't identify the gene for it. There's many other forms of EDS that they have identified a gene for but there was no definitive way to determine you had hypermobile. Now that it's there, it's great because now you can say, well, definitively I have the gene. You can't tell me I don't have EDS. It's real. Here's the genetic marker for it. But at the same time, a lot of us that have hypermobile are like, well, what if I don't have the gene and now I have to go back to square one? I have all of these problems and now it's not EDS. So it's both exciting and scary for a lot of us, um, but it's still in the early stages. And they said it's one genetic marker. They're, they think that there might be more. So we're waiting to see what comes out of it. And we'll keep you guys updated as more news comes out of this. But it is a very exciting medical breakthrough. This is really huge, you guys. Yeah, anytime that there's a new test that helps us identify anything definitively, or anything like that, it's, it's big for our community because so many of our diseases are kind of guessing games. And, you know, so many doctors that are like, oh, that's not real. You can't have that. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I love the laugh, Nicole. <laughs> well, you know it. They said it about lupus for forever. I guess they still do. Yeah. It's not real. Um, it's in your head. Oh yeah. But now like, it's just a really great thing to be, you know, especially for hypermobile patients to be able to say, nope, nope. See genetics, genetics say so. So we'll, we'll see what comes of that. And, uh, and then, you know, back to, back to COVID land. Um, We're back to, in a lot of areas, putting on masks indoors. Thank you. Unvaccinated people for Mm -hmm. the, Yeah, they say that this is now a, what is it? A pandemic of the unvaccinated. Yes. Which sounds very judgy. And it is for people who can get vaccinated. Definitely. But also a little judgy on people in our community that just can't get vaccinated because you can't, there are people in our community that can't legitimately can't. Like me. Like, like Nicole, sorry, Nicole. Oh, 
it's just devastating because you hear the news and you hear about the Delta variant being the dominant variant right now. And it terrifies me. And I'm, you know, and they don't know, like with people like me that doesn't have B cells, if, if we're having any T cell, you know, immunity, they can't tell. So, you know, when someone tells you, you might, or you, who knows, it's terrifying. I'm terrified to go anywhere. I'm scared someone's going to give me the Delta variant because no one's wearing masks around where I am. It's, it's few and far between. So I'm, I'm constantly scared. Right. And in LA County now, you have to wear masks indoors. It's official. It started last wow. night. Um, LA County, uh, and I think San Francisco County have mandated right. masks indoors, but people are mad. Some of them are mad for the right reasons because people didn't get vaccinated. And some of them are mad for the wrong reasons because they feel it's an infringement on their rights. Well, you know what? I'm not sorry. You're infringing on my rights too. Yep. And my right is to be vaccinated and be done with this whole fiasco. And yes. Because really it's the unvaccinated that give an incubation to these variants. And we're dealing with the Delta variant now. And there's also scientists studying this Lambda variant that should be the next variant that pops its ugly head. If yeah. You, if you're following the science, there are there's a Lambda variant that's out there that is also quite ugly. Oh, it's terrifying. Yeah. So just just to scare y'all a little bit, our suggestion, as always, continue to wear your mask Please, and yeah. get vaccinated if you can. Uh, the other thing is I, I was listening to some scientists say that, you know, B cells right now are the thing that they're testing to test for your protection against, the, yeah, your, against uh -huh. COVID. But they do say that it's not the be all end all of all the testing. That is what the scientists have been using to test. However, they just haven't developed tests for other, other ways to test your protection, your immune system's protection against it. So right now, as far as testing how well the vaccine, your vaccine and your immune system is working against COVID, Right now, the B cells are the only way to test it, but your immune system may still be protecting you very well in other ways. That's what I'm being told too, that the T cells may take over in a sense and you'll have T cell immunity, but there's no test for T cell immunity yet. And exactly. I hope the doctors come up with one. And they, they'd really like to, because for some people, B cells aren't their best um, defense against COVID. That being said... It's not a reason to go unmasked. No, it's not right now. Right now. And I know like the numbers seem don't seem as scary as they were months ago. Like it's like, oh, well, you know, there's only 300 people dying today and there's only 4000 people in the hospital, but it was 11000 people in the hospital and, you know, 900 people die. It's that's, but numbers are going up and yes, it's unvaccinated people, but let's just try to protect each other guys. Like mm -hmm. let's not have numbers continue to go up. Let's not contribute to the problem. Let's try to think forward. That's well, and one of the scientists said the other day that um, with the Delta variant, there was a large number of people that were hospitalized that were vaccinated and that's what they were concerned about. Well, yeah, it's breakthrough cases. So we yeah. have to remember the per, like the percentage of protection and people hear, oh, 98% effective. It's 98% effective against death. Death. Yeah. Not getting sick, not being not vented. Do you know what I mean? So death. Like mm -hmm. if people don't, the problem is people only go, don't go beyond skin deep with data and they don't listen. So like some people, honest to goodness, and, and I don't know, I really probably shouldn't go into the comment sections of Twitter, but I do, I do. <laughs> Why do I go into the comment section? Cause sometimes I have to be reminded of the depravity of humanity. And, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry if you are the depravity of humanity, but I'm going to talk about you now and people are like, no, 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 the vaccine gives, I took the vaccine. I should have hundred percent protection. And it's like, that's just not how vaccines work. Nope. Uh, like you get the flu vaccine every year and they tell you a, it only works against one strain of the flu. You can still get another strain of the flu and mm -hmm. it only gives you a certain percentage of protection. 
against getting the flu. Mm-hmm. And in this, and the COVID vaccine is the same way. You get a certain percentage of protection against dying. You get a certain percentage of protection against being vented. I think it's only like a 60% protection against getting COVID. And then you have to think about the long-term effects of COVID. Yeah. What if you get long? People. Yeah. We're, I don't want. Yeah. I mean, people who didn't even know they had COVID are now seeing effects from COVID that they got COVID that they didn't know they had. They're seeing effects from it six or eight months later. Yeah. Which is terrifying. Oh gosh. I terrible. Like I already have EDS and pots and stuff. I don't need any more effects. Oh. Thank you very much. Oh either. <laughs> I think I've said this many times on the show. So you guys are probably like, Oh, Kelly, just stop talking about this, please. I'm going to talk about this until the cows come home. So you can just like fast forward through this part, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, please just wear a mask guys. Please. Uh, we, like you, we like you listening. We like you participating and, um, we like you live. We like you live. Yeah. That part too, but you can listen if you're a zombie. That's fine. We like our zombie <laughs> listeners. Zombie listeners, we love you. Vampire listeners, we love you too. <laughs> and we're too. <laughs> we love all of you. We're we we are a uh, we're an all inclusive listening group. We embrace you. <laughs> um, okay, getting back to reality now. All right, that's our COVID lecture for today. Uh, let's do something more fun. So um, our mascots decided to take over today's episode and they have decided that it's really, really important that we do an episode today on pets. So Finn and Callie have decided that today's episode will be on pets and chronic illness. Yes. Very important episode. Now, mind you, they decided that it would be today's episode and they are sound asleep behind me. But we are so encouraged by their inspiration. That's right. That's Mm -hmm. right. So there may be snoring. It is not coming from Nicole or me. (laughs) It is coming from the bosses. That's right. Because you know, that's how it works. Bosses will dictate you do the work. They will hide in their corner when it comes time. Yes. Silly, silly little boys and girls. Um, (laughs) They're so cute. Anyway, but pets are important to our health. And we, we know this because there are many, many, many studies out there that show that pets improve your cardiovascular health, pets improve your mental health. Let's see, now Kelly's looking at me like, are you talking about me? Of course she is. Okay. See, she snorted. It's true. <laughs> and, um, but there, so there's a lot of studies that show that pets can improve our lives and, when you have chronic illness, any improvement to our lives is helpful. And we've done episodes on, you know, stress. We've done episodes on exercise. We've done episodes on, um, you know, movement. We did, we talked about that with MS last week. We talked about how cannabis can help, but pets are something I think a lot of us have or want in our lives. And when we talk about pets, most people immediately go to dogs, but there's a lot of pets that can be helpful. For instance, in the U.S. alone, there's almost 400 million pets in the United States. That's a lot of pets. There should be more. <laughs> and the most popular pets in the United States, surprisingly, are fish. Freshwater fish. I love fish. They're very soothing to me. And I name my fish after Disney characters. <laughs> all, the fish, all the fish I've ever had have been named after Disney characters. And I used to have a betta fish that, um, as I would like clean his tank, used to swim between my fingers. His name was Gus Gus. Oh, like, the little, like the little fat mouse in Cinderella. He was not a fat fish, but his name was Gus Gus. He was really sweet. But, you know, there's cats, millions of cats, millions of dogs, millions of birds, reptiles, horses, bunnies. There's all kinds of pets. People keep ducks, peacocks, roosters. Nicole's friend just got a rooster. Do not roll your eyes. You know, we see the, we see lots of people on Instagram now with their chicken coops. Yep. We, you know, we see all kinds of things online. So, and they just, you see people and they're so happy with their pets for the most part. 
And there's a reason why pet accounts on Instagram are some of the most popular accounts. Like, yeah. I don't know how many times a day I can send Nicole Walter Jeffrey videos. I love those. Oh my gosh. If you guys, sorry, like now maybe they'll spike, but Walter Jeffrey, the Frenchie and Mochi, the pug are two of my favorite accounts to follow. I, I feel that way the Frenchie too. He's so funny. Oh my gosh. But Walter Jeffrey is like always screaming, which is tell you <laughs> something about adopting Frenchies and because they, they are vocal, they are vocal creatures. And <laughs> Which is why you guys, anytime you adopt a pet, you really need to do your research into what you're adopting uh, because you have to know what you're getting into. But no, I mean, I'm an animal person, guys, and you'll find this out throughout the rest of this episode that I get attached to everything very quickly, even if it's not mine. Mm -hmm. Nicole also knows this because there was a dog I followed on Instagram a while back and he passed away and I grieved for a week. Mm -hmm. it was really bad. Like I still get really upset about Pudge. It's like, he was my dog. I don't get it. Um, yeah. Pudge was Pudge. The pit was like, Oh, he was the epitome of me. Anyway, (laughs) I get very attached guys. I will get attached to all of your animals. They will be mine. Yes. (laughs) Anyway, those are the statistics just on pets alone. So we, and we still spend billions of dollars on pets and that is just in the U S it's a little different for other countries, pets, probably in a lot of other countries, it's not quite as large or as obsessive. Um, and it can be much more expensive. I know like in Singapore, they have a very different relationship with pets. Um, it's more expensive to have pets. They have living quarters are much more are much smaller. It's much more expensive to live there in other areas. It's much more farming based. So that's a different relationship. There's a different relationship with farm animals versus pets also in different places. Like we're right now we're, we're classifying this episode on pets, right? And, and that's kind of the thing. So when you have a chronic illness, a lot of people think, well, you guys are just going to talk about service animals. And service animals can be really, really helpful to us, right? So I want want us to talk a little bit about the classification of animals. And there's three types of pets really that you can have. You can have a service animal, you can have a support animal, and you can have a pet. So you can have a service animal, and a service animal is any animal that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of a person with a disability, and that would include physical, sensory, psychiatric, intellectual, or mental disability. So a service animal is specifically trained to deal with that, and they have those specific skills. Now, that is different than an emotional support animal, and a support animal is does not receive that specific training. They can be certified as an emotional support animal. So they still get a certification, but they only provide emotional support, but they are, they, they are not specifically trained and certified as a service animal. They are both protect service and support animals are both protected under the law, but they get some, they do get different protections under the law. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of like how to explain some of these different things because it, it can get a little complicated, but basically a service animal has more protections than an emotional support animal. Okay. This does. It, but you would, you need to be able to provide documentation in certain circumstances so like if you have a a service animal you know you would have harnesses you have tags you have all of that stuff they cost money to train those animals they and they can though it can cost tens of thousands of dollars to train a service animal these are animals that you know you see people walking with they have the harnesses on 
it says service animal. These are animals you really shouldn't be, people shouldn't be playing with, they shouldn't be touching unless the animal is relieved of its duties at that time. And a lot of people, unfortunately, don't respect that. <laughs> and I, I know that I have a I have a relative who has a service animal and a lot of people. Now, I mean, mind you, like little kids, it's really hard sometimes because they just take off and whatever, but they take off with a lot of dogs too, which freaks me out. So for instance, like airline personnel are able, so there's a lot of misunderstandings. Like people think that uh, like airline personnel can't even ask you questions about your service animal, but they can. They can ask you the tasks or functions your animal can perform for you. They can ask you what your animal has been trained to do for you. Um, they can ask you to describe how the animal performs the task for you. If you have an emotional support animal, they can ask you to provide the documentation for you. And anyone who's traveled with an emotional support animal knows this because they require that documentation to be provided before you get on the plane. Like actually, they, I think they ask that it be provided when you purchase your ticket. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it has to be like, it has to be documentation provided by a mental health professional. It has to be, um, you have to have a mental health disability that's listed in the DSM-4, or I think now DSM-5. Actually, I think it's a DSM-5 now. And it has to be, and you have to have all their shots. You have to provide veterinary documentation that your animal is, is updated has all its updated vaccinations. That means that the animal can fly with you on a plane outside of a carrier. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. um, but they cannot deny you the flight. They cannot deny that you get on the flight, even if another person has like an allergy or doesn't like animals or a fear, they just have to provide reasonable accommodations. So like they could separate you to other areas of the plane, or potentially put one of you on a different flight, whatever it is, depending on the severity of allergies or something like that. Education settings, they have to provide accommodations. Um, housing, they have to provide accommodations and they can't charge you extra fees. Employers have to provide accommodations. Um, however, in the employment setting, you have to be able to your, your animal cannot be aggressive or hinder you or anyone else from doing their job. So this is where it gets like kind of weird. So people will get like, and this is what's given support and in service animals a bad name. People will get these, especially support animals. People will get these certifications online and it's fairly easy to get them because there's a lot of shady organizations online. Like a lot of them, all you have to do is say, I'm depressed. And some random psychiatrist somewhere will sign a document and you'll take your dog to work and your dog will bark all day. Or like some people have gone as far as taking ducks, horses, uh, peacocks. Well, mind you, sure, if you've got that bond with that pet, okay. But the thing is, is your pet can't disturb an entire workplace. And if your pet's disturbing an entire workplace, your employer has the right then to deny that pet. The problem is there are people with legitimate disorders that require that pet to be there. Yeah, definitely. And now you're giving all those other pets bad names. Mm -hmm. So like my relative who has her dog is, is trained to identify when she's about to have an, a severe anxiety attack. And she comes and she has specific tasks she's trained to perform when my, when my relative is starting to have an anxiety attack. I mean, she's a service dog, but it's still like, it's, it's very, very difficult. So, and then in a public area, when you have a service animal, the only two questions that can be asked of you is, is the animal required because of a disability and what work or task has the animal been trained to perform? And they cannot be asked if the animal's service tasks are obvious. It's like, if you're blind and you have a service dog, they can't ask you that question. 
like if you're in a wheelchair and you have your dog with you, no, no questions asked. So th there are rights, you should look at them online and know your, what, what is covered, but there are a lot of rights for people who have service animals and support animals. And that's just to be clear, those differences, but it's important to not be manipulative about them. Exactly. Respectful about them. And especially when it comes to emotional service animals. Um, Cause like Finn is my emotional service animal for when I'm flying, especially it's very comforting to me to have him on the plane. And he is a really, really great dog on the plane. Cause he just basically sleeps and he helps like keep me very low stress because I'm focused on him the entire time. He's such a star. I know, I know he is, but he helps yeah. with like, yeah. just keeps, keep me low stress, keep me focused on the right things. And that helps me with like my digestive issues when I get stressed and that helps me with some other things. And it's really, really easy. Callie is not low stress for me. <laughs> She's not an emotional sort of support animal, but she is lovely. <laughs> lovely. She is a funny one. But uh, so th there are those two things. And then there's just pets. So like, that's the difference between them. Like Finney is emotional support because he's just a snuggle bug and he just wants to be by you, but he is not a service animal. Like there is a huge difference. He's not going to identify when I'm having an anxiety attack. You know, he's just support. Like he's not trained for any of those things. He's not any of that. He's just like, here, I'm going to like pay attention to you and hold you and you're going to serve a sort of function where, and that's like people, I know that, so that goes into pets, having a pet. What can a pet do for you? Having a pet can also relieve a lot of your stress. So some people get fish and this is a great stress reliever for some people because you get fish and some, for some people watching the fish. That's what I hear. People say watching their fish is very relaxing for them and just brings them a lot of peace. Meditative. Mm -hmm. People used to do the, you remember the fish screensavers? Yes. They were real popular for a long time. Mm -hmm. People used to do that. Um, but for me, it was watching the fish and the sound of the um, filter. Yeah. It sounds like a little waterfall in the bubblies. Yep, it's very peaceful. Very peaceful. You'd turn off all the lights and it would just be the fish tank. Yeah. Oh, so nice. So, um, and there, there's somewhat low maintenance. Freshwater. Saltwater is a little higher maintenance. But uh, freshwater fish, a little low maintenance. You guys have had a lot of pets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've had too many pets. So the, that that's, so some people just get pets like that for like meditative cats also not super high maintenance because cats are, are overlaw overlords and they're going to take over the world. <laughs> Nicole is a cat fan. I am not a cat fan at all. No, not even a little bit. No, I mean, I don't want to hurt a cat. I don't want to see a cat hurt. I just don't enjoy having them around. And I love them. I love them. I love all the animals. So don't you do. You love the animals. And that's a good thing. Yeah. I've got two cats. One is a big Bubba and he's around 18, 19 pounds. And one is a tiny little darling diva who's about eight pounds of fluff ball. They are not mascots because again, overlords who want to yeah. take over the world. They're, they're lower maintenance because they kind of do their own thing. You only just really have to change out the litter box and make sure they're fed and watered periodically. They kind of clean themselves. They kind of, you know, you just got to periodically get their nails trimmed, but really if you get a good scratcher, they can also take care of that themselves because I don't trim the 18 pound cat's nails because he'll kill me. Yeah, he really would. Uh, yeah. I tried to get him into his crate recently and I'm just, and that was a year ago and the scarring is just going away. That's because mm -hmm. cats are assholes. <laughs> Nicole Sorry. said it didn't. He's also really big. And he was a tomcat before he walked into my house and took it over. Wow. Uh, not, that's not just a, that's not a hyperbole. That's a real story. He followed my father into the house and the house became his. <laughs> He decided what he wanted and that was it. That was it. That was it. Home. I'm home. Mm -hmm. Home mama. Mm -hmm. 
deal with it. Oh yeah. That was, that was that for him. So, um, yeah, so cats are, cats are a little bit of fun, but, um, no, they're, they can also be super playful, super lovable. You know, I have a cat who, I had a cat who every morning like to chew on my eyelashes to wake me up. She was, she was very snuggly and I, you know, my girl cat likes to snuggle into my armpit. She's really weird that way. She likes armpits. Very strange. Mm -hmm. People will tell their cat stories. They're, they're really, they're really affectionate and they can be service animals too. In some ways they can, there are cats like there, there's been cats that have, uh, that can like smell out cancer. That's what I heard. I read about that. And and then, well, then there's the death cat. So I don't want to talk about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but they're, they're really good. There's the library cats, the ones that like to live in libraries for some reason, there's always this, they like the smell of books. Um, but in any case, there's cats, bunnies, people, people all have their things about their different pets that they love to have, but they really do enrich people's lives. And so you can get out there and you can adopt. And so I think a lot of people with chronic illness think that they can't have pets because they can't afford them or they can't take care of them. And I don't, I don't think that that's true because I think that there's ways to get support. So if you're looking for a service animal, we'll put some links up in the show notes because service animal takes time to get, you have to apply for service animals. You have to have a reason to get a service animal and there's organizations that you can apply to all over the country in the world that can get you service animals. Like, you know, if you're blind, there's organizations that specialize on training dogs for the blind. There's organizations that specialize in training emotional support for, you know, for people with severe anxiety and depression. There's, there's organizations that train specifically for epileptic, for people, for dogs that are trained for epilepsy, other organizations that train, um, their specialty are dogs for autism. So there's different organizations uh, for, for different disorders and there's organizations that can connect you to those. So we'll put some links up in our show notes for that. Some of those organizations charge money. Other organizations have like scholarships and you can find ways to help offset some of the costs if not get those animals for free. Because yeah. them are nonprofits and they're supported by donations. And if you're listening and you want to donate to one of those organizations, they would be more than willing to help offset the cost for someone who needs a support animal. Yeah. There are, there are plenty of people on waiting lists for some of these. Um, not all of them have waiting lists, by the way. Nope. But there are, there are some organizations that have waiting lists. So the best thing you can do is look at different organizations see which ones you fit into and see what they have available. And people can, uh, you know, what I love is uh, every year or twice a year here in Illinois, we do clear the shelters. I know they do it nationwide, but it's wonderful because they're, they're free. You have to fill out the application and go through the process, but then you don't have to pay for a pet. And for me, like I could never afford to go out and spend three fifty for a pet or two fifty. I couldn't do it. So looking at getting a pet in the future, that's when I would get a pet. Well, that's for a pet. I'm talking specifically about service animals. I would- general, if you wanted just a pet. Right. So that, that would be the next thing. If all you want is a pet, you could do, that's the low cost adoption fees. A lot of organizations during clear the shelters do reduce their adoption fees. Now adoption fees, a lot of times what they're doing with adoption fees, because some people are like, why are adoption fees so high for some of these organizations? And it's usually to offset veterinary costs. Mm -hmm. So they're usually to help pay for the spay, the neutering, um, the shots and, and all, and, and those, and the housing and the food and all that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's usually why, you know, a lot of times you're seeing anywhere from 150 to $500 depending on the organization. Yeah. Uh, but they do several times a year, there's a clear the shelter and, that's a great time if you can't afford the fee at that time. Um, sometimes you can even negotiate with them. Mm-hmm. 
if there's a specific pet you want. Some will take payment plans, some have scholarships, depending on what your situation is. So you can ask. And really, they're looking to place pets in the right home. Yes. So they're not, it's not all like if you have the right home, a lot of times, and you can look to foster too. You could say, you know, I really want to foster this dog. I may be looking to adopt in the future. It may be that they'll place to foster and then consider adopting them out. So just ask guys. It doesn't hurt to ask. Definitely. These organizations really do want to place these pets in the right homes. That's that's their ultimate goal. They're not holding back on pets because they want to hold back on pets. They want to make room for another pet that needs a home. Um, and if you're not sure about getting a pet, fostering is really the best way to test it out. Fostering so I, is everything for you. You know, the shelter, a couple of the shelters out here that I was dealing with, they're like, we'll provide a crate, a bed, a food. And they're like, if you can provide any of these things, it would save us some money. Cause I was like, I, I don't need anything but the food. That's yeah. it. Yeah. They, they really fostering is a great way to test things out for mm-hmm. yourself to see what you can handle. Mm-hmm. If you're looking to adopt, the number one thing I'm going to say is do your research before you adopt to know what you, you can handle. Like if you, if, if you aren't going to be able to go for really long walks and you live in an apartment, don't get a high energy dog. Mm -mm. Just, just don't, even if you're like, well, I'll just take them to dog parks, you know, every other day so they can run off their energy. No, just don't. your high energy dog is going to go nuts. So it doesn't mean you have to get a small dog. It just means you could need to be real and get a low energy dog. And actually yeah. large dogs tend to be lower energy anyway. My like Rottweiler sleeps 72,000 hours a day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I found that my smaller dogs were higher energy than my larger dogs. But like, you don't get a border collie living in an apartment and not take it for walks. It's like, you just can't do it. They will tear Mm. apart your apartment because they're super smart and they get bored easily. Yep. Um, So know what you're getting into when you, when you're looking for it, do a lot of research before you go and adopt. That's my number one piece on that part of it, because a lot of pets get returned because people didn't do their research and they're like, oh, I can't handle this dog. Right. I can't handle this cat. I didn't know that this cat was going to claw up my couch. Well, cats have claws and they, they need to claw things to, you know, that's how, that's how they file their nails. They, that's why you get them, you know, 37 scratching posts because right. I'm, I'm just telling you, your furniture isn't, the corners of your furniture don't stay nice when you have cats. You have to prepare for that. Also, you're going to get hair all over things when you have pets. That's the other thing. Right. You prepare for these things. I just tell people, I'm like, if you're offended by me having hair on my clothes, it's my pet glitter. Get over it. <laughs> pet glitter. I love that. <laughs> I sparkle with pet glitter. <laughs> Like I would rather have pet glitter all over me than have a conversation with you. Um, I get very offended when people are offended by my fur babies. So, but just be prepared and know what, what you can handle, but don't think you can't handle it. Be, you know, so don't think it's all about money. Uh, there's plenty of ways to offset your costs. So I know a lot of people listening are like, you guys are talking about all this, but you're talking about dog crates and you're talking about scratching posts and you're talking about food and I can't, and you're talking about vaccinations and, and vet visits and spay and neutering. And I can't afford those things. Well, you can afford those things. You can, because there's ways to offset them. There's pet food pantries. Um, so I know we, we watch all these commercials and stuff and they're like, you have to feed your dog the best food. You have to feed your cat the food you make on the stove. Okay, first of all, don't, you can make your dog, you can make your cat, you can make your bunny, whatever the food you feed on the stove. However, 
to do that, you have to make it perfectly nutritionally balanced for what it is. And it's not really recommended because you're never going to get it right. Well, you can, but it takes so much effort. Pet food is balanced. Almost all pet foods out there are pretty well balanced. And it's not super expensive for most people to just go out and buy decent pet food. Just putting that out there. If you are in that situation and you find yourself in a situation where buying your pet pet food is hard to impossible, like you lose your job, you've been hospitalized, your medical bills are preventing you from it, there's pet food pantries, just like there's food pantries for people. And actually some of them are combined. Just look online for your, or, you know, ask your food pantry where is a local pet food pantry? And they, you can get directed to a pet food pantry where you can get food for your cat, your dog, your bunny, whatever they, they stash up pet food that people have donated. And you can get your pet food there. You just have to look locally for one. There's low cost vaccin- vaccination centers, vaccination fairs. Um, I know Petco hosts them, PetSmart hosts them. Um, definitely a few of my local pet food centers, like we have Cahoots out here, which is my favorite name for a, a pet store or like a pet food store, Cahoots. My, my dad's like, where are you going? And I'm like, I got to go get dog and cat food. I'm going to Cahoots. <laughs> Just love saying it. It's funny. Um, love it. It's so fun. It's anyway, um, there's healthy spot. They, they offer low, low cost vaccinations uh, once or twice a month sometimes. And I think uh, ASPCA does in certain places, just ask around for when there's gonna be low cost vaccinations and they are seriously low cost. Some of the, sometimes you can even find them for free. Uh, same thing with spay and neuter. Oh they, yeah. They'll do low cost to free because really they're trying to keep down um, certain pet populations and keep down, um, the numbers of pets in shelters and unwanted pets. So there's a lot of low cost bay and neuter. So there's really a lot of ways you can get the health services that your pet needs. Uh, and you can get them really low cost, if not free. Which is wonderful. Right. And, and so I think that opens up doors for a lot of people to get the pets that where I used to go to at VCA, they did a lot of um, services for homeless people. Oh, wow. Yeah. So homeless people who had pets, they did a lot of their, their, uh, they had, they worked with an organization that did a lot of the health services for homeless populations. Yeah. Cause that's a lot of ways that they adopted out some pit bulls that were um, unwanted in the shelters, which by the way, you guys, pit bulls, just my service announcement right now. They're wonderful dogs and they are wonderful to have with you. And they are loving and kind and so loyal. Um, so that's my service pit bull service announcement for the day. Please don't dismiss them in shelters. They can be, my favorite. they can be so great. So, so, so great. I actually looked to adopt a few of them and every time I'd go, they were already adopted out. Yeah. They're, they're really intelligent animals. They're so great. They are. I just, they are truly my favorite dog. And now I can't have them because I have, I already, I have too many pets now. So my HOA won't let me have any more. They're so pretty. They're so smushy. They're so sweet. My sister's got one that's a mix and it's so cute. Anyway, I, yeah. Okay. Sorry. That was my pit bull service announcement. Wait, what's your sister's dog mixed with? The, uh, well, she's got two now that, well, one we haven't confirmed is mixed. Um, I think it's lab and pity we think, and right. that's the puppy that she just got. And then the other one is pity. Oh gosh. Now I forgot what she, what he's all mixed with. She was just shocked that there, there was uh am staff in there. Oh, okay. Which I wasn't shocked because he's huge and he <laughs> is such a loyal dog. And he Aww. is so loving. Oh, and he's really good with the kids. That's yeah. great for people who think that they're not good with kids. They're wonderful with kids. Well, they're nanny dogs. 
Yes, they are. So you guys, we're going to go off on a pit bull tangent, she and I, because we both love them so much. Okay. But honest to goodness, don't overlook them in the shelters because they're really good, especially with people who need love. They're just really good dogs because they really feed into your emotions and what you need. A lot of dogs will, by the way, feed into your needs. They, they really will. And this is why I love them so much. I just love dogs and cats and goats. Okay. So that's their health services. So let's talk about daily care. Cause that's the other reason why I think a lot of people with chronic illness are like, I can't get a pet because I can't take care of a pet all the time. And I, you know, cause I'm going to end up in the hospital or mm-hmm. I can't walk them. Um, what if I injure myself? What if I um, am too sore to do anything with them that day? What if I can't feed them that day or water them that day? By the way, when I say water them, I mean put water in their water bowl. <laughs> like not, not water not. them like they're a flower. Um, what if I can't, you know, take them for a walk? What if I can't um, do whatever you have to do with your pet? Like clean out the clean out the fish bowl, clean, you know, yeah. if I can't do these things. So there are places you can pay to come do this. There's WAG, there's Rover. Um, there's plenty of local services that you can pay to come help you do this. What I like about some of these is you can establish relationships with specific people on those sites. So I used to have someone on Rover that would come stay at my house when I would go on vacation I have now I have a place where I drop off the dogs. It's called a paparazzi, which I also love the name of. And like each okay. of the rooms is named after a celebrity. Like last time Finn stayed there, he stayed in the Brad Pitt room. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. It was like it, it was uh it wasn't the Brad Pitt room, it was like the Brad Mutt room or something. Like they named them all after celebrities and mix it with dogs. No, I think it was the Brad right. Pitt room. It was like the Brad Pitt bowl room or something. Anyway, it's all named after dogs and you get to, you can watch your dog 24 seven. So they have cameras everywhere. You can like, you log into the website and you can watch your dog the entire time they're there. So you watch them play, you watch them play with the other dogs and they can either do a sleepover so they can sleep with all the other dogs or they can have their own room where they go in and they go to sleep and they, that's where they sleep. Mm -hmm. It's a little fancy, but also like peace of mind of while you're away, being able to see your dog the entire time. And so I think a lot of um, kennels are going to this model uh, where you can watch your dogs while you're away. And it's because it's inexpensive to just put in a bunch of cameras. So there's that. And like when I used when I used Rover, when they stayed at my house, the girl was like taking pictures and texting me the entire time. Oh, that was really nice. Definitely. And that's when I had Lucy and she was very special needs. Definitely. She had to have her diaper changed all the time and meds. So I didn't want to put her in like, it's very hard to put her in like a, a, a kennel setting because of everything she, she needed. She really had to have that one-on-one. So yeah, this was before I knew I had special needs. My dogs all had special needs. I used to have to give Roscoe his insulin shots for his diabetes and all his medications for his thyroid disorder. And then Lucy had like her uh, steroids and her diapers for her incontinence. (laughs) You guys, I've had a long history of with chronic illness, not just with my friends, but also with my pets. Nicole knows. She's like, yeah. She's, oh yeah. She remembers. I'm like, Nicole, how do, how do I check? How do I check Roscoe's blood sugar again? <laughs> <laughs> she used to give me advice. I'm like, why do I have to change over to the, the humulin? I like this other, I like this other insulin better. <laughs> oh gosh, it's such a long journey, but he was, he was my soulmate. But yeah, there, so there are services that can help you with that. And that's also saying something because if you do have a dog that has special needs or a cat that has special needs, these services also have people that you can leave your pet with that are trained to deal with your pet's special needs. Yeah. 
So don't <laughs> overlook a pet that has special needs if you're capable of taking care of a pet that has special needs. Sometimes it's nice to have a pet that has special needs when you have special needs because you guys can relate to one another. That's why I want a boxer. <laughs> I thought you wanted a bulldog. I mean a bulldog. I'm sorry. See, that's what happens. My brain's going, but they're always, they can't be in the sun too long. They can't walk too long. They can't go up too many stairs. I'm like, oh my God, this is my soulmate. That my is soulmate. your soulmate dog. <laughs> Perfect for me. Yes. It is her soulmate dog. Really? really? It really is. Yes. I want a fat bulldog named Chuck. <laughs> We're going to get you one. Don't you worry yet. We're going to get you there, honey. I, I got to get there. Cause I really want one. She does. She wants a baby. She wants a baby chunk. Yes. A baby chunk. He'll be so cute. And then we'll post pictures of him on the website. Yes. And if you think with this episode, you're not getting a million pictures of our mascots. Yeah, it's common. <laughs> um, Cause I, I adore them. You, you can utilize these services. Obviously you can commandeer members of your family. If you have family, uh, because before my dad got a little more frail, he took care of my pets when I would travel. Now he's a little more frail. So I ha- that's why I have to use these services because when I'm away, he can't take care of the babies. It's too much for him. So there's other ways though. There's other services. So again, when we're talking about low cost, so like if you're hospitalized, what do you do? If you, you know, an emergency hospitalization and you don't have family to come and help or friends, obviously friends are great. Like I have friends that I could leave my dogs with in an emergency. Other people have family that they can leave their pets with in an emergency, but that's not always the case with everybody. There are organizations that can come in and help you right away and we'll, we'll take care of that. So you can look them up and, and make sure you have those numbers on hand. Mm-hmm. They, they do, they will do, they will help with that to place them in a quote unquote foster home. Like, a, like you would with a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so like, these are children, you know, it's yeah. different than like a biological child, but in some ways they are like children. Are. But they, there are organizations that can come in and help you with that. It should any emergency happen. Even animal care and control will sometimes come in and help depending on how big they are. And there, so there are organizations that can come in and help. There are local families that sometimes will come in and help depending on the size of your town. Mm-hmm. There, you just, you have to, the, the key is, and this is why I keep saying, if you are going to adopt a pet, you do your research first, look up your organizations, look up what type of pet you want, look up, look up where you have pet food pantries, look up where you have local va- vaccination fairs, look up the low cost neuter and spay, which likely if you're going to adopt a pet from a reputable organization, you're, they're going to come spayed and neutered anyway, but look these things up before you adopt. So you have all of that. Yeah. And Even so need to watch your pet. If you would, you know, if I were to get another dog, I would always make sure, okay, I have this person in line. If I get sick, I have this person lined up. I have this place for vaccinations that are cheap. I have this, I would have all that done before I even got the pet. Exactly. I don't want that in a bad position. Correct. Correct. And it's different for different types of pets. Like mm-hmm. I could leave my cats for two or three days because I have feeders for my pet. Right feeders and and watering and they're, you know, and I keep them full, or I might just have to say, you know, oh, can you just run over and fill up the feeders and they can just, they'll be fine for a few days, but the dogs won't. No. Cause you can't do that with dogs because dogs tend to eat all their food at once. Yeah. They, They, you know, they, they're gobblers. So cats are, will regulate themselves much better. Um, so and like fish, they're, they might be, a, you know, you could get someone to throw in, there's like these feeder things that they'll be fine for four or five days on their own, or your fish might eat each other. That's a whole different story. Same with gerbils. Um, so you just have to know which type of animals you have, which will be okay for a couple days if something should happen to you and who you can have to come in and take care of them. 
so plan ahead for those things. If those type of things might happen to you. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you can do that, having a pet, it's, it's not so difficult. And the thing is, if you have a service animal, here's where it's different. Your service animal is allowed to come with you. Should you have an issue? So service animals are allowed basically anywhere. Yeah. So they can't discriminate against your service animal, not support animal. Support animal is different, but your service animal can come with you. So just remember that. So if you, if you do apply for a service animal and get it, just please make sure you know all the rules because somebody is going to be stupid and I'm being really harsh, but there are plenty of stupid people out there that are going to try and tell you that your service animal can't come with you somewhere. And they're wrong. And they're a hundred percent wrong. You need to know the law and you need to know what's right and wrong. Um, again, though, we're going to put all of these things in the show notes. Cause we've talked a lot about a whole lot of things. A lot of stuff is local. You guys though, for like where you can adopt a pet, we'll, we'll put like ASPCA stuff in there. We'll put some national organizations you can go through different types of searches you can do in the show notes. And then hopefully, you know, hopefully like if you're thinking about adopting this helps you guys. Cause I know we said do a lot of research and plan it out, but it's not hard. Um, I encourage you guys, if you have questions to ask them in the Facebook group on the Facebook page or in the Facebook group, because really you guys, Pets are the best thing ever in any type of pet. And like I said, I've had a lot. I've had a lot of different types of pets. Pets are awesome. And Nicole right now, because her mom is like no pets until maybe we move, is like really wanting a pet. I do. I really want a doggy. So she goes over to everyone else's house and plays with them. I do. I I'm like, you are, I like adopt other people's animals. Like they're mine. Like I love them. My neighbor, every time her dog sees me, he goes crazy. He's, he's my boyfriend. He answers to there's my boyfriend. He's so cute. And I love other people's animals so much. More than I think they're children. I'm telling you. And I think it's just something that brings us joy. And we deal with a lot of hard stuff all the time. You guys, we deal with pain we mm-hmm. deal with depression, we deal with anxiety, we deal with, you know, dizziness and disorientation and sometimes not being able to work the way, you know, our bodies just don't work the way we want them to. And, you know, we deal with trying to think of thoughts and we're in a brain fog or, you know, we can't get down the stairs the way we want to. Like sometimes I have to stop midway through the stairs getting up there and there's Kelly by my side looking at me like, you Okay. Are we going to go up the stairs some more? And that's the thing. That's the thing about having them with us is like, they make us laugh and they, they bring us joy. And I, I can't, uh, I just can't imagine my life without them in it, you know, emotional support animal or service animal or not. I, I don't know that I'd go through another day without a dog or a cat or whatever in my life again. I just don't, I've had, I've had dogs since I can remember. I've had cats since college. Yes. See, here comes Finney. He's like, you're talking about me. Sure is. <laughs> um, and I don't want another day without them. So you guys, and again, we're totally willing to answer questions, willing to help you, help you guys do some research. Even if you're in another state besides the one we live in, I'm glad to help. I, you know, I used to help do rescues before, so I'll, I'm glad to help connect you guys to some different rescues if you want some help with that, because the more I can do to help get pets out and adopted, the happier I am. Be encouraged, you guys, and love your fluff balls. Love, love your, go hug your fluff balls today if you have them. Yes. Don't hug, don't hug your fish though. No. They need to stay in the water, guys. just admire them and tell them you love them yes all right guys have a good week tell us how your week is going on the facebook group and we will chat more next week 
Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.